Welcoming to an exciting panel on this World IVF Day, COVID-19 and IVF industry scope and challenges in the pandemic era is the topic we are going to talk today. And before getting on to the panel itself, I would like to give some context to the to our audience on the panel. The COVID-19 pandemic, as for all sectors, has imposed significant changes for the world of IVF. The industry saw major development like surge in egg freezing, use of cell, self-administration uh, you know, device. We so we have a panel of experts who will be talking about how the pandemic and the new technology intervention will have a long-term implication. Through this panel discussion, ET Health World wants to bring in top IVF experts of India to deliberate on how the fertility industry is creating a far-reaching impact during the pandemic. Thanks a lot for all the panelists who have joined us. I'm introducing the panel to you all, Bhatmashri, Dr. Indra Hinduja, Director, IVF, Department of IVD, PD Hinduja, National Hospital and Medical Research Center, Honorary Obstetrician and Gynecologist, and was received Exceptional Women Achievers Award by Governor of Maharashtra. Next to the panel, we have Dr. Rishikesh Pai, Medical Director Bloom, IVF Group, President-Elect Foxy, pioneer in the field of infertility in IVF since 1991. Welcome, sir. Thanks. We have we have Badmashtri Dr. Kamini Rao, Medical Director, Millen, the Fertility Center, one of the country's most re reputable names in the sphere of assisted reproduction and high, high risk of strix. Thanks, Dr. Rao, for joining in for the mm -hmm. session. Next, we have Dr. Prakash Trivedi, gynecologist, president ISAR, a well-known name in the... Uh, Gynecological laparoscopy and urogynecology. Welcome, Dr. Travedi. And last but not the least, we have Dr. Shitis Murdia, CEO and co founder of Indra IVF, one of the youngest doctors in India performing IVF since 2010, and he holds a fellowship in infertility. Thank you, Dr. Murdia, for joining in. To begin with, I would like to ask the panel in India, every year we have about 2, 2 to 2.5 5 lakh IVF cycles in a year conducted. So how has it been since last, you know, one and a half years since we have the pandemic hit us? And how is the segment itself affected by it? And I would like to go to Dr. Indra uh, Hindu Jafas. Most important until in March 1920, 2020, we were going through IVF very regularly. It was 11th February, 2020, where it was declared by WHO that as a COVID, as a pandemic. And soon there was a talk on the TV by Honorable Prime Minister Sri Modi Ji Jinhone, lockdown declared. Kiya. Until lockdown, we were doing very regularly, same way. But after the lockdown, we had to restrict only to those cases which were ongoing. And ongoing cases which were there, half of them, they themselves cancelled because they could not attend. Some of them, we asked them that you had to go through the freezing cycle. And some we did, of course, embryo transfer because they were from out of Bombay or out of India. And after that, at least my department was completely locked until very recently. So this was the one which we thought, whereas in the private hospitals or in the private clinic, probably they were doing cases slowly, gradually they stopped because it was not only the risk for the staff working in the clinic, as well as the patient. Pradipa, I would like to say that uh, because ours is a multi-centric center within the city, we had uh, a lot of challenges here. One is we need to have many teams. Now, considering COVID is a very novel virus, we also had to be sure that it is not only protecting patients and the offsprings, it's protecting our staff as well. And we didn't know the A to Z of the virus itself. So if you had one person that was actually in trouble, then that person would have to be quarantined for the three weeks 
so which means that all the contacts were traced and they were also quarantined so which means that if you had to do that then the theaters were closed the ivf theaters were closed the embryologists as well as the clinicians were quarantined so people would not have three three ivf labs or two ivf theaters so in fact that center would have to be closed luckily for us we had two and three teams that were actually put on this thing and they actually worked at steeds and since we had five centers in the same city so we didn't actually depend on only one center we were able to continue the procedures only thing is we had skeleton staff so we had very few staff working on the patients at that point with social distancing and with all the ppe kits um, available and also strict adherence to principles of asepsis as well as uh, masks and gloves as well as the kind of uh, you know um, gowns that they had to wear even though it was very very difficult in the beginning but we had to practice it and then we had to go ahead of course we did have you know the patients as well as the uh, uh, healthcare workers getting uh, the covid but at least for the first 3 months we were able to see that our healthcare workers were protected but this cannot happen in the private sector where there are single standalone clinics so one has to be very clear that in single standalone clinics this problem is bound to happen because the nature of this virus is such that when you start a treatment and then you find that that rt pcr is negative there is no guarantee at the time of pick up that it will not be negative so then what do you do at the time of the pick up if you don't see whether it is positive or not that means you may be actually putting a needle into a covid positive person and that used to happen all the time so that means the lady would have actually taken the injections should have paid for the injections and then you don't even collect the eggs so therefore i think it was better to close down in such cases rather than to stimulate the dispersion but not transferred any of the embryos we free froze everything and we are still frozen and some of them are now coming back for the transfers how it stalled one and a half years like you know you you're saying still patients are coming in i've listened to two uh, panelists here how has this been it was a tough phase for everybody in the healthcare segment but how tough it was and how you're slowly overcoming that if you can touch upon that please. you know first two three months what happened was our prime minister rightly uh, got in a lockdown and actually that really helped us to give us a direction in what we were doing so we realized that we had to close down the uh, the unit and in the meantime what happened is that our european society has a uh, organization called eshri so they came out with a guideline so what happened was the lockdown occurred the guidelines came and in june we reopened the units based on the guideline so the guideline said that only those emergency people you should treat them first and the elective people you can so the emergent like uh, women with low ovarian reserve women who wanted to get their eggs frozen but their reserve was very low all these kind low sperm count all these kind of people who could not wait they started coming more and the people the couples who were already married but they didn't have that much pressure see infertility is a elective kind of procedure so they postponed it so the 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 traffic the, the patient that started coming to us were more who were needing the ivf in the on the emergency basis that two months of closure because there's a, again there was a tussle between livelihood and life you understand that is a problem which all of us across economies have faced all the industries including the health industry how much we should run so there was definitely a disruption there was a uh, in our group we have got seven ivf centers all over the country and we now group we had a 50% fall in our uh, you know the in revenues that came in and because ivf is a like kind of a semi elective kind of uh, system the federation put in a old guy and then the icmr dr kamini rao headed that icmr team and that we also bring brought the guidelines they were a bit late because the government was occupied with the vaccination but ultimately the guidelines came in and over the last one and a half years but what happened was the second wave that came that was not handled by all of us well so we continued running the unit through the second wave but the revenues were massively collapsed so i personally feel that what we have learned from this whole episode we need to apply it to the third wave 
which will come in September October whether the patient should first finish both the doses of the vaccination and then come for the treatment so there's been a lot of let us say uh, there was a, there's a lot of real time adjustment that is taking place and as we talk also we are evolving our real time response to this you know massive disruptive covid pose but i'm sure that we will win at the end and our ivf industry our infertility industry will come back to normality and my prediction is by march when the vaccination reaches a good number of coverage and all our healthcare workers are protected we will reach normality between march and uh, uh, you know june of next year this is what i predict yeah thanks for that overall picture dr pai a uh, quickly going to dr prakash trivedi uh, so about the guidelines dr pai had mentioned so how it was to you know quickly prepare the guidelines and you know give it to the whole uh, ivf uh, you know experts and community to roll it on and how it is right now because the third wave is also coming in so if you can just tell us about yeah. the whole yeah. one and a half year roller coaster you had so on 6th march i became president of isar and from 13th march the flights and all got uh, stopped being a past president of foxy and iig we had enough amount of obstetric practice in fact on 25th of march i have an ivf patient cesarean now the situation we have to understand that this was a, a virus was an issue wherein the politicians used to suggest us what we are supposed to do instead i went into details of covid each and every aspect so except stopping ivf except stopping evening consulting and interacting with ashri asrm and during this period we addressed to 45000 consultants on various aspect essentially we didn't keep everything at a stop because our uh, deliveries some of the abortions were going on later on we found an excellent solution for the world for doing laparoscopic surgery but as far as ivf is concerned to get those guidelines you have to remember the guidelines the number of viral viral load in different countries are different so then we had to sit in isar with lot of experts and we formed guideline at least the guidelines were very clear and the biggest thing was that if we had somebody positive then you have to stop your center for another 14 days so a large number of people and as you can see most of the panelists plenty of them are 60 65 plus so nobody wanted to risk them or their staff so basically we 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 stopped um, the new cases we started having uh, cases on one side we had our abortions or deliveries or endoscopic surgery going on with the same group of staff but when it came to ivf we had more stringent criteria to hold on wait for a significant time the ivf revenue may have gone down to 20% but then because it's an entrepreneurial center and uh, which is a national referral center we could manage a lot of case when doctors were not available in which we felt that we were satisfied over a period of time and then we found that the results uh, added to the second wave of course there, there is there is an important thing we have to understand uh, for medical problems we find politicians to guide us it's it's a, it's a it's a parody because we are supposed to guide the politicians so we have to follow what the norms are there we have to follow and the government has done phenomenally well and i am extremely happy and proud that gynec as a profession as a whole including ivf has done phenomenally well to serve the women of india and we still are doing dr murthia i just wanted to ask you you've been vocal about the impacts of ivf during covid you've been talking to you know give us an overall picture we had uh, listened to all the four panelists if you can just give us a uh, you know impact of how it was and how it and how it should be thank you pratibha for inviting me and it's a pleasure sharing platform with such eminent uh, uh, doctors and teachers and leaders i would say for me Uh, because i am very young and very new in of everybody of them so it's a pleasure to be here and i think you rightly mentioned uh, india was doing across two to one like cycles last year there was lockdown and we had to shut down all our clinics across the country i think country might have done say 1.25 to 1.5 lakh cycles there was a lot of emotional uh, burden i would say on the patients because one they had uh, shifting of their ivf treatment cycles with lot of uncertainty as to when we would be able to start when we would be able to get back on track and would finish the cycle and you know in a in a country 
India, uh, you know, it, it comes with such a stigma and a taboo that they are already very stressed about not having a child or not being able to conceive. And then on top of it, the uncertainty of COVID and when the treatment would start. I think that paid a lot of uh, emotional stress onto the couples. But rightly said by the other other uh, panelists, I think it was a good decision to stop the treatment for the uh, first two or three months so that we can take care of the safety of our staff, ourselves, and most importantly, the patient as well. Because you know, patient safety is the is the at the center of the healthcare helm. I would say. And then when we started back in June 2020, I think that was a lot of uh, precautions, a lot of uh, guidelines had come, as Dr. Pai mentioned from Ashray and Dr. Prakash mentioned from, from ISAR. There was a triage questionnaire. We would check the temperature, mask, sanitizations, do the COVID testing before we take them for operative procedures. I think of that, including uh, frequent testing of our staff, and if somebody comes positive, we shut down the lab for a few days, get the COVID test for all the entire other staff. I think keeping all that measures in place, now we've seen confidence and especially the vaccination drive. So this time in the COVID, across all the centers, we had 94 across the country, we see less impact compared to the uh, first wave of COVID. Although the number of infections or number of people getting infected were much, much higher, I think, three or four times higher than the last time. But then the confidence, uh, with, because because of the vaccination, high, because of all the precautions that all hospitals and the IT centers are taking in dealing with the patients, I think the sentiments, the confidence has returned back and patients are coming. Although, I think this is something that could be delayed but avoided. I mean, you know, having a child in India is, is one of the most important aspects, I think. So people could delay their childbearing but could not postpone it for, for long. So that's my view. Yeah. Going ahead, I also wanted to ask, like, you know, IVF cycle is a planned preparation for several months, be it for the couple or for the doctors, the experts. So with this lockdown just came in sudden and the COVID protocols also being late. So how was the patients at this middle of the cycle who had to, you know, come in, if they were in the middle of the cycle, how prepared they were, how did they cope up and how was it, was it difficult for you all? If you can talk about that mental health status and the emotional status, Dr. Rao, Kamini Rao, if you can just start with your comments, please. Well, um, when patients had actually started at the beginning of the cycle, there was an inkling that the, there was COVID in the air. So there was some speculation around that there is something there of a virus which was not that easy to swallow. It was not like a flu virus. So there was some amount of apprehension, some amount of disbelief, some kind of a feeling of uneasiness was there with the doctors, but we did not know what was the nature of that particular you know, problem. However, when we talk to patients, we always counsel them that there could be a problem for example, that the follicles may not come up properly or even if the follicles came up, we may be able to do an egg pickup and we may not get the eggs, in which case the cycles will be cancelled. So in any case, there is integrated counselling for these patients as we go along. So along with that, what we did when we started off with these IVF cycles, we also told them that we don't know the nature of the devil that we have with us with COVID. Of course, we didn't predict that there's going to be a lockdown. But what we said is that we don't know the nature of the problem. And if there should there be a problem with the virus in terms of the offspring, then we will not be responsible for what it's going to be because we do not know what's going to happen. So the only way we will find out is maybe four or five years later when we do some kind of longitudinal study and we see the, uh, the um, neurological development of these babies after birth, then only we'll be able to find out what kind of effect these babies will have. Other than the physical defects, which we may be able to pick up on ultrasound. So the question is, some of them drop out of the study even while going through the treatment. They postponed it and went on oral contraceptive pill. And some of them said, doesn't matter in any case. You know, what is to be is to be. And they left it to God. And then they continued the treatment. And some of them said, okay, fair enough. We will postpone it by another this thing. And then went on 
with some kind of other treatment like an IUI or something like that. They didn't go in for an IVF. But the ones that went through IVF had some kind of an inkling. So they didn't argue with us. Where the problem will come is when you don't counsel them. So already the amount of cycles that we had 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 come down to 50%. So it was not that all of them were going through the treatment because people had started postponing and also because the number of job cuts and work from home and of course the amount of spare money they had for the child, all that had also dwindled. So people were saying, let me wait for three months, let us see what happens and then we'll go for that you know, uh, pregnancy because it was an elective procedure. So having said that, and with 50% already dropped and the other thing, we could actually sit down and counsel them, though of course we were not very sure to what extent we should counsel them. So when they were in the middle of the, suppose they had just started the cycle, then I would like to say that yes, we would tell them to postpone, but we did not force them to you know, postpone, but we left it to them. Then they took the decision and they said, no, we will continue. But they, when this happened of a lockdown, as I told you earlier, I did not actually postpone the cycles. I continued the cycles. I had a separate can. So all these cases went into that can. It didn't come into the regular can for freezing. So all these cases have got a separate container for the freezing and they were still continued. We did not cancel the cycles and we've got them in the separate container and they will get it back. So now when you see ESHRE and all the other international bodies, they say you still go ahead and you still go and do the IVF. So retrospectively, when I think what I have done is right. So I don't have any problems. I have not actually transferred these embryos, but I can still transfer these embryos because we've already got from the bodies that we can still transfer these embryos. How careful you had to be in this one and a half years while we were doing this. Dr. Indra, your points, please. Tele consultation was the most important. And there, most of the questions were about this COVID disease. They wanted to know everything why it was cancelled, when should we start, how do we start. And let me tell you one thing, the patients were much more read on internet than we could cope up with the literature. Then there were a lot of papers coming up that there are receptors on the oocyte, receptors on the embryo, receptors on the sperm, there is an effect on the testes, there are found all these, they had read it on the internet and they will question us. So looking at the thinking about at the knowledge and when we have to restart, we had to be much more careful than anything. First, most important, our most of the medias had expired. So we didn't know how much to order. Then we had to procure different PPE for the patient, for the staff you know, risk safety forms we had to design because being a hospital, there is a medical legal cell there. So they wanted to check everything that whatever we do, we had to change our consent form. We had to give them the first little information about the COVID, what it is, how new it is, how does it affect and mention in that we really do not know what will happen being a new disease. So we had to design that. Then we have to design the other type of consent that they are responsible if anything happens. And most of them were the patient who wanted to do during COVID. You know why? Because the women were very ready. Okay, now I'm working from home. And this being a general hospital, there was a demand about oncology patients that what shall we do about that? So being all that, all the oncosurgeons were asking us that we want to freeze this, we want to freeze that. So we had to start in the very small case. But let me tell you, it took us almost 15 days. Earlier, my, my consent form was only three pages. Now, if you see my consent form is eight pages. So first we give, never gave them the consent form to take it home. But now we give them that go and read it. If you want to evaluate on the internet, go and study whatever we have said it is correct. 
and then you bring the bunch of papers and then if you agree we will do it and that is how we started first ivf and majority of them were for onco for the preservation of the gametes as well as the gonadal tissue then we were the people who were wanting to go because of covid because of covid i'm adding to it we had uh, interesting uh, views from both the doctors here and uh, they were talking about the positive side so can you tell us how it was like in a, the with the lockdown and sudden covid protocols and how was the patients emotional stress and how it was going i feel that the covid has shown that the human race has really dom and the science has dominated we could sequence the disease very quickly we came to know what is the transmission mode we knew that it is through contact and through droplets and we also knew that it is airborne because that was very important once we keep quickly came to know about the way the virus is behaving there was a rapid response from us at the same time the industry started making the vaccine and everything was very quickly done just look at how the human race has very aggressively responded similarly at our micro level at the we change uh, the opd structures we change the lab protocols we brought in a lot of protocols safety protocol because we came to know how the virus behaves that it is going through the airborne and i would like to tell you we did a interesting study on all our patient that came we did we used to do a regular mandated rt pcr so our pre- prevalence rate of the disease was between 2 to 4% so out of every 100 patients who came because we did rt pcr on every patient in the mumbai region but not in the delhi because the delhi government in the initial phase had not allowed rt pcr to be done in elective patients but in mumbai we did rt pcr and our prevalence rate was 4% and in our staff the infection rate was 10% so we we had to make the batches and that's how we c- countered this infection rate within the staff then there was a stabilization so in the middle the biggest weapon or which the ivf industry has got is cryo preservation so if you have any problem you just freeze the oocytes you freeze the sperm you freeze the embryos and at the same time again science came to our aid because science told us that there is not much transmission although there is a receptor expression in the embryos there is not much transmission through the sperm or the oocytes and that scientific knowledge gave us the 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 assurance that yes we can go ahead and do the ivf and we could then freeze the embryo so we were not sure about the embryo transfer whether the infection would go to the patient or not so we we were advised to freeze the embryos and transfer at a later date so the first wave i feel was tackled very well but then what happened in the second wave was the mutation has come and the so the the mutation has added to the problem of the second and the third wave our response to the second wave according to me i am not been happy the 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 period between jan december jan november december january february march was excellent we stabilized economically also because ivf is a big industry we have a lot of people employed and there was no pay rise there were pay cuts kind of little bit of pay cuts so there had to be an economic stabilization which occurred in till march then the another second wave has started but we have probably not my according to me i have my response personal response to the second wave has not been proper but i have already planned for the third my prediction is september october will be the third wave and the response to the third wave according our group has decided to have it just like we did in the first wave the first wave we had the teams we reduced the work time we adjusted it intelligently second wave we was were caught unaware so the third wave response has is going to be very means i am going to have a very metered response to the third wave and the vaccine that has come in the vaccine has made a major difference the protection that it has given our patients is very important and that assurance of the vaccine has because what happened in the first one year there were emergent patients were there you know patient with low over and reserve patients as dr indira induja said with undergoing uh, for fertility preservation before cancer treatment so patients who were older because they they said that the time is running out for them these were the patients that came the remaining patients stopped coming now with the vaccine and the assurance the other patients who are very important chunk nearly 50% of patients are normal patients with normal ovarian reserve normal sperm count younger age group that has started coming again and as the vaccination increases that will come in but 
I will. I feel that this is a long term problem, and we have to adjust ourselves to a long term kind of response to this problem. Dr. Trivedi, what was your experience? How had been uh, the preparations for the several months right now, and uh, what are the you know middle of the cycle? How people had cope up uh, with this pandemic? Yeah, I think so. I have very specific points, and uh, I fundamentally believe. Uh, uh, geniuses in the field of women's health are not born in crisis we are born to exhibit in crisis and my thought process is always you have a problem and i rush for the solution because if you don't understand the subject you you just can't read in terms of when the lockdown came so suddenly we had three compartments of patient one group of patient who has come from abroad one group of patient who are out of bombay one of group of patients were around bombay and all and in that some group were wherein you know you just you cannot wait so of course the people who are from abroad or people who are from out of bombay and we have already done the pick up we have already prepared the embryo then depending on the scenario even though at that time there was we went through literature and we were reasonably sure that there was no increased risk of viral transfer except theoretical discussion by some of the embryologists trying to dig and find out so we had done transfers in patients who were out of bombay out of india because for logistical purpose people who were from bombay we made a policy that we gave an option okay the freezing is the best option for you because here you are around and then prioritizing uh, uh, what to do now another interesting thing what i observed was there were many round the corner wherein we had told okay this is your last iui and then we'll take you to to ivf and uh, believe me what happened is when actually uh, lockdown came 6 out of 10 conceived in iui there are many patients irrespective of who are the ivf consultant there are many people conceived in the lockdown at home and the last observation which i had there was higher demand for voluntarily abortion this was something which i have not noticed in our center and also there was higher incidence of abortion in patients of ivf so we had a clear clear scenario and of course at those time we used to when we started consulting it was like six appointment for 3 hours and we had um, um, all the um, triaging and strategy and now for example day before yesterday or so we had 18 patients in the morning uh, 12 patients in the evening uh, things have changed because we learned from endoscopy and other aspect that the risk parameters in ivf is more in the lab and handling of the lab and handling the gametes as long as you overcome that otherwise freezing was the solution what was the ups and downs and how uh, you had uh, initially also talked about the emotional stress of the patients if you can give us a rounded uh, you know thought on that yeah no i i think the guidelines all uh, discussed about halting the treatment because it's not an emergency treatment so we had the uh, treatment being shut down at all our clinics i think there were two three groups of patient people who just not started and were taking medications we had counsel them to prolong or delay the cycles uh, people who were under some medications have taken some injections and the pickup is due we went ahead with the pickup and then froze the oocytes or the embryos depending on patient to patient i think we 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 proactively stopped doing any embryo transfer whether it is a fresh or a frozen embryo transfer because we all know we were fighting with an unknown enemy i mean i don't know whether there's a a uh, mother to child risk of transmission whether there is a risk of transmission in the liquid nitrogen whether there are receptors like madam said on ace2 receptors on the embryo and you know could potentially a, a embryologist infect an embryo so i think considering all that unknown factors surrounding covid uh, we had stopped the uh, embryo transfers for that period and then slowly once we had all the guidelines coming in and a lot of information that poured in after that in in june mid or july i think we we started doing embryo transfers after that but there was a lot of impact i would say on on other things on revenues and everything and it was a very tough time to make sure that you stay afloat and you know stay alive during that period and i think everybody i mean all all ivf chains and all 
uh, all clinicians would resonate the same thing that the entire fraternity came out with a good support in in accepting those pay cuts uh, your entire staff was very uh, supportive and i think you know we've tied over that effect and i believe although i believe that third wave could come but uh, the the impact i am seeing is, is going down and i think uh, you know there would not be a major disruption especially in the ivf considering the uh, vaccination considering the precautions that the hospitals and the patients are taking i think there should not be a major disruption now in the in the third wave even if it comes how did uh, patients with comorbidities like uh, diabetes hypertension uh, was there any such cases any quick points from there like you know are taking ivf during the pandemic i would like to make a point that you know what we need to understand that the uh, you know there's a new study that has come from birmingham that if you do a surgical intervention after the covid infection you should not do it within 7 weeks they have found a little bit increase incidence of mortality risk and that is why in our group we have taken a decision to do if there is a covid positive patient in the past the we have taken a buffer of 3 months this is our internal decision based on the birmingham study rather than 2 months we would take but because there is a derailment of lot of system within the there is something called a asymptomatic long covid and they, it can have a multi organ infection so we don't know th- this disease is very funny so we don't know what are its long term effects so we have decided to have a 3 month moratorium for a previous covid infection we would because the uh, iwe with the intervention is not major it's just a surgical over pickup is not a major semi uh, in, uh, invasive kind of procedure but it still entails anesthesia it still entails a lot of this thing so we have taken this decision of for safety purpose dr kamini rao was heading the icmr i was also part of the icmr group which has come out with the covid guideline uh, for ivf art cycle so we do a triage we do the day two we do the day two testing for the husband and wife with rt pcr and prior to giving the final injection just before getting the exot we have to we do another rt pcr testing if it is positive then we cancel the cycle or we can freeze the embryos or the gametes so this is the standard protocol which is being used by everyone for so that we have safe practice and the last point is as far as the vaccine is concerned i would prefer that both the doses be taken and then after that you do the procedure but some people you know the what the problem has arisen that the gap between the two doses is a major issue so if the gap is going to be large then when do you do the you take the first dose and then when do you do the pick up so our advice to them is that after the first dose you can do it any time but our our protocol is one month at least before the taking them up or 15 to one day, one month but prefer that both the doses are taken and then we do the procedure yeah dr rao you wanted to make a point here yeah. yeah my thoughts on this has been and when you talk about comorbidities let's look at comorbidities as an entity minus of covid so whatever you would be doing for those comorbidities you will anyway do for those comorbidities so suppose it is covid and comorbidities let's treat the comorbidities as though those comorbidities is there without covid and then you treat the covid like you're treating covid so therefore the covid is going to be there anyway so you're going to take them as high risk and certainly your comorbidities are going to be treated it's like pregnancy with any of this diabetes or hypertension so certainly you are going to get a multidisciplinary team and then you are going to look after them um, properly now when you are looking at the covid now normally the standard practice would say that if they have had an active covid infection 3 months is the time that you should give them before you start the treatment of ivf for them now second thing that is because of the cell mediated immunity and for that antibody levels to come up if you take it scientifically and say that okay i'm going to make sure whether that person has had a take on the vaccine which means that do we see enough of the igg and has the igm also taken then you have to look at the neutralizing antibodies to the spike proteins of the covid that is that corona the thing the kind of the crown uh, the crown kind of the the spike proteins and then you'll have to look at the levels of that particular antibodies and if it is an adequate number then you know that the take is good so the antibody levels are high in spite 
of having taken two doses of vaccine earlier it used to be after four weeks now they say it can be taken as much as three months later after the first dose the longer the distance from the first to the second dose the better it is now they say three months so which means it's almost 12 weeks after the first dose but even with one dose of vaccine there is going to be quite a lot of protection for this person and also for allowing the primary and secondary response to one dose of that vaccine having said this now what i would like to say is that you continue stimulating and collecting eggs even after your first dose that goes side by side with your ivf you don't have to wait let them go side by side but don't say that i will finish the ivf then you take the vaccine because over the vaccine is very very important and it has to be simultaneously in fact if it's a question of one week and i'm going to take the vaccine we can postpone it by a week or so okay. so simultaneously taking it no problem if you want to say that that woman has had a covid infection and she's got those embryos in the um the, the can then perhaps active covid infection 3 months later you can transfer those frozen embryos inside so wherever you look at comorbidities the same principle of how you would do it minus of covid is the way that you will manage with these people they are going to be high risk and then they are going to be the same where the question will come in here pratibha is where patients have got cancer where they are on immunosuppressants where they are on renal failure where organ transplants have taken place where the antibody levels are not high that is where you cannot look at the spike protein antibody levels because you may have very misleading results because the antibody levels are not going to be high so in such a case can you depend on antibody levels and say that the person is protected the answer is no so what do you sort of really wait and see well what kind of response will they have god only knows see all of us here are ivf and infertility practitioners and before that and after that we still are women healthcare worker and there is a brilliant cue i will give you even before the vaccination we had huge number of patients women who had so much blood bleeding that they could not wait for covid to come covid to go vaccine to come vaccine to go then we had huge number of patients of cancer who could not wait for surgery and a huge number of patients of fibroid and urine leak and what happened incidentally we realized even before the vaccine because we essentially catered to a rt pcr negative our staff is repeatedly investigated our anesthetists everything and we realized that the best time to operate was during Uh, such time because all roads were empty all doctors were available our staff was quite often stationed so cue from that is if you had problems which were severe enough and you had comorbidity and you got treated in two days and you went back home you can focus on your comorbidity later on but this was a very interesting thing in fact i told them this is rather a good time and when they had a file or when they had an appointment nobody stopped them and we had maybe 440 patients treated and all these patients of that of course there were 150 were with comorbidity and they could focus on the comorbidity because the cancer was removed laparoscopically fibroid was removed uterus was removed simple problem with urinary leak a tape is fixed or a tablet is given so i think so comorbidity you have to remember people are having comorbidity when they are sitting during covid time they don't pay attention to the comorbidity which increases if you are not giving treatment we have to take care of the complications of the pregnancy many a times we know it that multiple pregnancy is a uh, difficult to manage than the single pregnancy therefore we have to look see in such a way and prevent that you must transfer only one single embryo so that there is no added risk to the woman along with the comorbidity i was talking about this vaccine what we do is that we allow them to take first vaccine we wait for 7 to 8 weeks then you stimulate her just before a time of the second vaccine we do the pick up and freeze the embryo as soon as she has taken the second dose and 3 months later we do the transfer 
so they are happy that something is going on and we are not wasting 3 plus 3 that means 6 months i would like to talk about the technology which is very important so uh, i want to know like in during this one and a half years how technology has helped you all and what are the kind of changes you have seen like you know in the egg freezing or in the recombinant drugs if you can just give me two three pointers uh, you know quickly on how technology has helped you all now and how the next gen technology like artificial intelligence is coming in to ivf space as well so how it's going to change the whole process in covid basically zoom as a technology really was a breakthrough means the digital communication was a fabulous uh, breakthrough and we all used it very aggressively and it's going to continue being used because i feel that it's a fantastic thing need to interact more with the patient electronically and then you can of course be it can it has to be a hybrid so that is one part of it the second part is you know we also started outsourcing a lot so you know initially patients used to come to us for scanning everything but now we have got tie ups with all over the cities so they, they can go to the nearby sonologist and do the scanning and they can in, give us the information about their follicle so that itself then you know self administration of medicine also is a very important so minimization so now even the patient behavior has changed as well patients are not going to come to the doctor that often at the drop of the hat so that behavioral pattern may we may see that being persisted in the post covid era so as far as the uh, actual technology is concerned artificial intelligence we have already incorporated in our unit we have got new technology for selecting embryo so we can now actually Uh, you know if we have more many embryos and we want to select only one embryo for transfer we can take the photographs and we have tie up abroad so we export it to the server and the server can tell you which is the best embryo to transfer to give you the best chance of pregnancy 10 to 12 eggs to freeze uh, to have a adequate chance of pregnancy in the future but now there is a new ai technology where you can take the photograph of the eggs and the computer tells you whether these eggs will give a pregnancy in the future or not so you if suppose of uh, the first cycle you have got less some number of the computer says no these eggs are not good enough to give you a good chance of pregnancy in the future you can tell the patient to have one more cycle and before she you know has enough eggs to freeze so these are a lot of new disruptive technologies that are coming in uh, we have a non invasive genetic analysis technology also which we have introduced so this interim one two years of covid period uh, we have also upgraded ourselves and we have come with new technologies how they will pan out in the future is only time will tell many of the technologies you bring but they don't they are not very effective and they are white elephant so time will tell us as to what but ai is going to be there in every field not only of reproductive medicine but also in other fields of medicine yeah dr rao yeah, yeah. like what uh, rishikesh is saying i think why is ivf even though it is very easy to set up why has it not been scalable in the corporate world and that's a question we need to ask everyone says that we won't be scratch the surface we won't be done 3% of what we could do in the market and most of the corporates have failed to succeed and it's a, a very a very high hanging fruit is because it's very consultant specific now that's because it's very much um, you know uh, a consultant driven um, procedure and it's not like a mom and pop shop where you can have the blues and the dressing and have all these delivery units so to uh, actually combat those issues one is the technology the process so if you can actually have the ixi process so you got these embryologists who have to be trained so suppose now you have robotic uh, surgeries like they have the robotic things for endoscopy you have robotic ixi now so which means that if we just place the egg there then you got both the you know the forceps as well as the injecting pipettes all actually robotic so that can be done the second thing is to have a big lab with you know for example the incubators and then you spend a lot more since the tier 2 and 3 cities so where they don't have that much of you know continuous electricity so what about the invo cell that is actually a vaginal incubator where they can actually put the egg in the sperm into this um, small invo cell and put it as into the patient's own vagina 
and then use that as an incubator and then take it out and then put it back into the uterus. Now that becomes a very simplified version of an incubator. Of course, you may not get that kind of uh, results as you would get into the incubator and you wouldn't do the ICSI. So when you take them out, you don't know whether the fertilization is there or not. But nevertheless, there would be fertilization and you may not get uh, you know, 100% fertilization. But whatever is there, at least you can get some you know, pregnancies out of that. The third thing is that the microfluidics, that is lab on a chip. So which means that you can actually get very small quantities of fluid and then you can actually be able to see that this particular egg and the sperm with micro quantities of fluid you can actually get the embryos at the end. The third thing is max, choosing the best sperm for HC. So that also is very possible. Earlier you used to have the embryologist taking at least about half an hour to prepare the sperms. But when you have the special preparation devices, it becomes almost automatic and within about three to five minutes, the sperms are prepared. The other thing that we also look at is when you are looking at it, there are also small uh, you know, strips where the man can actually test his sperms almost every day, for example. Now, he doesn't even have to come to the lab. Many of them may not be able to come to the lab to give a sample. So they can actually test it at the comfort of their home. Then teleradiology, for example. Now, they can actually put the vaginal probe inside and do follicular monitoring at home and connect it to their mobile phone. And the doctor can read the follicular sizes. And with a pen, she, she can actually inject herself. So it actually prevents them from coming to the hospital to get a scan done and also to get the injection done. So which all means to say that you're making it very, very comfortable for the patient and the number of times that they come to the hospital is also reduced. And therefore, this kind of technology is making it easier for the patient. It's making it less hazardous and it is making it more COVID friendly. So who says COVID is bad? COVIDity is positivity. And I think, you know, who says that, you know, you have to come and wait for long hours in the clinic? I think this sort of an artificial intelligence will also help people. For example, the witness that you've got, the electronic witness that is there will also tell you that there cannot be a mix up of sperm and egg of different uh, people. And that witness is also very important. So therefore, you can also, at the end of it, give a DNA report to the patient to say, this baby is yours with a certificate. So which is almost like an ISO chapa on that baby to say, yours is really yours. Success rates are going further and further, higher and higher. And if we can track that implantation block and increase that, I think then we have actually cracked the Da Vinci code on this question, like, you know, how do you see the artificial intelligence and technology coming up and how it's helping the IVF sector? I think it's it's a great topic to discuss. And as Dr. Pai mentioned, you know, evaluating oocytes, evaluating sperms and embryos and even the genetic makeup, it, it's all under development. And I think in the next few years, we would have more and more of these platforms coming into use in, in real patients. And the ultimate idea of all these technologies is to increase the objectivity in your lab. You know, otherwise, the entire process is very subjective. I see with my eyes this embryo as grade one. The other person sees this as grade two. And that would create a disparity in the, in the judgment. So the idea is to have more and more tools, more and more things that would increase the objectivity and consistency across all the procedures so that you know uh, as 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 madam mentioned you know healthcare scale up so you know healthcare businesses can scale up just with good training creating more skilled manpower and having these automated or ai based platforms that can give you consistent outcomes you know year on year or day on day or procedure on procedure or patient on patient so i think and, and, and many healthcare uh, verticals have changed with the use of AI and surely IVF would change in the next few years. I think, I think with all these technologies coming in uh, where we can you know, predict the outcomes in a, in a better way. Well, all these new technologies has been already discussed. It is definitely going to give us a better idea about the quality of the egg, sperm, embryo, receptivity and so on. 
but after developing all that we have to really look into it whether it can be affordable now with our economic crisis which has gone down and where every patient is thinking at least 10 times given they have lost the job they are working from home it is uncertainty so at least during the covid time we have to think over how do we reduce the cost of the patient without compromising the results so this is what is more important in this actually today's discussion well technology has it is difficult to spend the money for ivs especially i'm talking about the covid time so how do we reduce the cost and remove the burden of economic crisis on the patient this should be our first aim what uh, dr indra said was like cost effectiveness so uh, being the president of isar what you have to say technology we can't do away with it and cost effectiveness well uh, there should be you know over to endoscopy ot has technology which nobody has in the world now to have technology in the world is one thing but give result is it is another thing at least in this covid time and what technology has done is we have addressed 60000 consultant all over the world so our conferences are becoming more and more virtual which is the biggest gain we are having now when it, when it comes to advances for example i'll give a simple example of laser in laparoscopic surgery which three four laser i worked from 1995 onwards and uh, at the end of i had told the company and i had told the place of lasers in gynecological surgery is in the dust bin so basically you have to remember you need person to work out all this artificial in- intelligence you have to work out you have to have a man who is going to identify that embryo which somebody is telling so i think so what happens is we have to understand there are beautiful technologies coming but all technology is a progress is never science so basically you have to document and support it because lots of technology will come you will get excited ivf people will get excited and it will okay with this it can make a difference and 3 years later you find it didn't make any difference so i think so there is, there is very thin line between getting excited of any product and passing it to the patient without any financial addition which is first point passing it to the patient without financial addition we do a lots in laparoscopy but when it comes to ivf and so many costly product so i agree with people that there is no end but at the end of the day even artificial intelligence is a product of human intelligence so basically you have to have somebody who mans somebody who helps and makes things much more easier or as madam told indira indira it should be cost effective so at isar level or any higher level or whatever level it is documented evidence hard core documented evidence i have read everything about all this artificial intelligence till date has not proved that this is a breakthrough but they say that it is going to be a big breakthrough which i agree with most of the people one of the things i have i have been requesting and i think prakash we all have been saying and we have to bring ivf under the ayushman bharat scheme because ivf is who has declared it as a disease and this on the 25th this is a ivf world ivf day what are we doing Why, why are we having this discussion? Because we want to make people and planners aware of the importance of infertility. It is a problem. It's a social problem, mental problem, emotional problem, financial problem, and the planners of this country have to understand that WHO has declared it as a disease. And this declaration, what does it mean? That it has to be incorporated even in the insurance as well as in the Ayushman Bharat scheme. This yeah. is what it is all about. I just want to ask the what is the long term impact and effect of and the learnings from the COVID, not just from the COVID. How we have to carry on and move forward. This pandemic that is going to continue for some time years, going to be here, uh, you know. So how we have to continue with this pandemic and how we have to evolve with it. How how we have to move on and what are the you know lessons we have learned. So quickly three points, ma'am. Okay. See what I think. What the learn the lessons learned from this is of course. 
hygiene. It has helped us to understand the discipline in hygiene, washing hands, making sure that there is masking and social distancing. I hope that this is this discipline of hygiene continues, and it's a very good thing. I hope this continues because what will happen to COVID is not that it's going to go away; it's going to live with us in some form or the other, and it finally becomes an endemic. And like a flu jab, we're going to have this every year because the antigenicity will change, and we'll need to take this maybe once or twice a year, whatever may be the antigenicity change or mutation. The second thing that we're going to do is also to be constantly on the lookout as to what are the changes in the embryo that this COVID can bring. Because at the moment we know that these receptors are found on the surface of the embryo, and we don't know the significance of this. It's only when all these babies, both naturally conceived as well as the IVF, uh, are born, and then you see the kind of growth curve on these uh, babies that are born and see their learning and their process, the IQ, etc. Only then we will come to know what the effect has been. The genetic problems because of the IVF and the COVID is again anyone's wild guess. And thirdly, by finding out a vaccine so fast, we've been able to find out that this particular vaccine has helped to actually protect us against this. But since there has been a very strong view that this is a novel virus and a man-made virus, which means that has been genetically engineered with four spots of this particular virus having been engineered by man, we don't know what the long-term uh, effect of this is going to be and whether it's going to change our genetic status as, uh, as well. Because there have been fears created by a lot of scientists to say, don't mass vaccinate everybody because that is going to actually cause a lot of problems. Now, whether that is going to be true or not, we are yet to see in future. I'll just point out three bullet points majorly. One is, I would say, adaptability of your business model. I think, uh, you know, COVID taught us, uh, you know, how you have a workforce of 100 people or 1,000 or 2,000 people and they have their families to take care how your business model such be, be such adaptable that you know you can tide over any crisis it could be covid it could be something else that could come in future so i think the adaptability on the business model is what we learned uh, should be very high your your organization should be having a high resilience so you can adapt quickly to the challenges and you know tide over the crisis one second i think uh, to use more and more technology uh, be it on, on what Dr. Pai mentioned and create economies of scale so that you can offer the same quality of treatment to more and more people who are not affording it, as Dr. Indra mentioned. You know, how do we offer these technological advances to more and more people at an affordable cost? So I think embracing technology, uh, embracing technology and create economies of scale and, uh, uh, you know, try to serve the poor people. And I think third most important thing is how do we leverage technology like teleconsultations, like you know, counseling and, and keeping in touch and engaging more and more with our patients to make sure they are at ease because of this already COVID situation and infertility being a social stigma, they're already very stressed. So how do we counsel? How do we keep in touch? How do we engage uh, with these people so that we can increase our, or, you know, better serve these people and have better outcomes they are mentally and socially more stable so i think i think these are three big points that we as an organization learned in, in covid how to you know come out of the crisis and you know still help people uh, realize their dream of parenthood crisis pandemic and bad time is a true time when your intelligence and your power to innovate goes to the highest. One of the classical examples in laparoscopic surgery, where all guidelines in the world went wrong, focusing only on smoke evacuation, aerosolization, etc., etc. We were far too fortunate to have double closed circuit system and work with a patent published in a journal. And we have given it to world a modality by which you can do safe laparoscopic surgery not only in COVID time, but you can do it any time. So, see, this innovation comes because you had a crisis and people all over the world has accepted and there are a lot of awards given. And that is one thing which is very important. 
more important that as an isar president and even otherwise as a fertility expert as a president i have generated fund there are other funds and we have 45 ivf cycles which can be done free which includes through isar centers we can get it done free which means the center get certain amount the drugs are given free there are criteria and we want this to be utilized as soon as possible we are already utilizes utilizing it this is apart from the fact uh, that the, like my parents charity may be there those may be personal but we have reached to both providing a solution to the world and providing a solution to everybody in any corner of india they can get at least funds and drugs for 45 ivf xc cycle and they can get uh, the treatment free at any center of the choice and that's a big service which we are doing and which we'll continue to do good thanks a lot for that information dr prakash uh, quickly moving to uh, dr indra there uh, yeah uh, yeah ma'am your uh, quick pointers yeah i would say that we all should have the together efforts to res- do the research to innovate protective equipments medicine drugs vaccine so that we get an exit from this covid pandemic and also develop and establish the economic recovery one second which is what i want to really say it reporting of the covid cases with or without pregnancy complicated or uncomplicated to be recorded nation wise and to create a consolidated database so that whatever dr pai said that artificial intelligence can be applied to create a logarithm to manage the complicated cases so reporting is very very important to get the database nation wise then only we will be able to solve our problem madam said is right the big data is very important and this is another of my thought processes where in that i we feel that we need to connect all the medical uh, facilities and create a central re- data registry not only for covid but for all medical purposes because our development sure. goals are based on data unless we have the data collection and probably there may be a need here for legislation where the every medical facility any procedure you do have to have a data entry because that is very important for us to plan our strategies in the future that is one thrown out this covid infection has thrown out the digitalization the it industry has become strengthened we have the new vistas have opened up in various aspects not only in terms of consulting how do we consult how do we treat the patient how we are going to use like technology in the future so there are huge amount of thing that have been thrown up and it's a ever evolving process we'll see how it goes research is also very important and so you know all these things integrate and we will see so you know i always felt that we are now, you know many of us are 60 plus now but now actually is a new age there's a new tomorrow we have to change with the times and all of us are looking at a totally new kind of paradigm shift in what we are going to have in our life in the future thanks a lot uh, so my uh, questions are over and i thank each one of you i have extended few minutes because the session was so interesting very no- nice points coming there thanks a lot once again for joining us uh, joining et health world and giving your points this world ivf day uh, we'll continue to bother you for more such sessions and more such interactions and more such deep insights coming from you all thanks a lot thank to each one of you thank you thank you